I am going to start the PowerPoint presentation so that people can see the quotations that I'm referring to. Just can you see that? Yes. Great. OK, so I'm, I've changed the title very slightly, just one word. So it's Hamlet translation and the cultural conditions of philosophical foundations. And it's always the, the way that a speaker will change their title at the last moment. So I'm taking the, the, the benefit, my right to do so, if you like. And I think this might be quite a strange paper to start this year's philosophy speaker series, because as the title indicates, it's going to be about Shakespeare, because I'm a Shakespearean, I think, and it's going to be about translation. It is philosophical, but I'm not going to be discussing in detail the specifics of a particular philosopher's work. And it's, this is a, a question of methodology, because the disciplinary boundaries that are imposed on academic study often force us to decide what group we belong to to say, I'm an English scholar, or I specialize in philosophy. We're segregated into further groups, of course, in those categories. So I call myself a specialist in Shakespeare. You might be a specialist in Victorian literature, in continental philosophy, or even further in just Schelling, or in just parts of analytic philosophy, and so on. And even the so-called interdisciplinarity is always plagued with these questions, partly because one needs to belong to a department, and practically speaking, because whatever writing we produce needs to, to belong to a bookseller's categories. And so research in interdisciplinary areas is also plagued by these, these boundaries, because we need to think when we're dealing with different kinds of disciplines, where we lie in between those things. In my case, am I using philosophy to discuss Shakespeare? Am I treating Shakespeare as a philosopher? Am I using the the different ideas in different kinds of ways. So the hope is that one doesn't subsume one side for the other as an interdisciplinary scholar. Now, ultimately, I'm not going to classify what follows other than to say that it's me talking philosophically or thinking philosophically through questions that present themselves when one considers Shakespeare's most famous speech through a different language. So without further ado, I'm going to talk about to be or not to be. It is, it is not, what is that, is actually the very first printed appearance of Hamlet's fourth soliloquy in the Japanese language. And it's in a completely garbled and incomprehensible pidgin Japanese. This January 1874 print appears in the British satirical magazine, The Japan Punch, as part of a cartoon you can see on the PowerPoint by Charles Workman, featuring a man in a samurai garb standing on a stage in deep thought. Now, it's really difficult to convey just how discombobulating this translation is. In the words of Yasunari Takahashi, the Japanese translator, the Japanese translation of the soliloquy sounds so jabberwocky. And the reference is, of course, to Alice in the Wonderland. In other words, it's so meaningless, it might as well be nonce verse, not an expression of existential crisis. But it's worth trying to convey how it sounds to Japanese ears. For instance, the line, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, comes across as something like, if more okay inside head, there is pain. So it makes no sense. Now, the fact that Workman, the cartoonist, himself was a fluent speaker of Japanese makes this doubly odd. But as Masao Tanaka has established, the reason this soliloquy is so incomprehensible is because it's written in a form of English-Japanese Yokohama slang that Workman is satirizing by translating the words of Hamlet's soliloquy using this, Hoffman Atkinson's exercises in the Yokohama dialect, which was a simplified phrasebook for expatriates living in the foreigners area in Yokohama near Tokyo. In other words, the comic shows by rendering great literature completely meaningless that this kind of approach to language learning is similarly empty and ridiculous. But even if Workman's it is, it is not, what is that turns out to be a kind of satirical and unserious translation of Shakespeare's speech, it still points out something crucial about the untranslatability of this most famous line into Japanese. Even today, it's an acknowledged fact that to be or not to be can't be translated adequately into Japanese because to be has no equivalent Japanese verb. In fact, in the afterword to the 2003 new translation Hamlet, the translator Shoichiro Kawai 
lists all 40 known translations of this one phrase, that is all published translations of this one phrase, starting with Workman's 1874 comic and going right up to his own translation. As Yoshitoshi Murasato points out, these translations fall into three main types. Those that use the verb to exist, those that use the verb to, verb to become, and those that infer the meaning to do from the original to be. Now, over half of these translations, the 40 translations, focus on the first of these, that is the to exist or not to exist. And in Japanese, these can, these can uh, also become variations such as to die or not to die, or to be in the world or not to be in the world. None of which sound extremely awkward to the ears of English speakers, but they do force Japanese into Japanese language into awkward and unusual contortions. So you might think that to exist sounds like a especially reasonable substitution for to be, but there is a gap between to exist and to be just about as wide as the difference between existentialism and ontology, if you accept that there is a difference there. And as the Japanese verb to exist is rarely used without a subject, it creates a severely ungrammatical sentence that doesn't really work in Japanese. I'll come back to that later. Now, if a translator opts for to become or not to become, our second option, it does shift away from the immediacy of the inquiry and changes the nuance or it changes the question that's being asked. But in Japanese, at least, it opens up a number of possibilities, such as, is it fine to continue as now or not? Or more simply, is this fine or not? That is the question. It might be quite evident from the fact that neither of these translations contain the verb to become, that is, is it fine to continue or not? It, in English, it doesn't sound like it contains the verb to become at all. It's difficult to express in English how these verbal parallels of be to becoming are maintained in the Japanese. But the benefit of these versions, these two um, subcategories of to become, is that it's not clear how, uh, what as now or this refers to. So the meaning of the line is questionable and it's suitably vague, but the existential dynamic of the soliloquy is lost because it's not about existence anymore, but about status quo. Ozujiro's 1966 Hamlet translation makes takes uh, the third approach and decides on to do or not to do, a form that was repeated by Yasunari Takahashi in his 1992 performance edition. Once again, this translation loses some of its existential force, and at the expense of its context, it turns the speech into part of the question about Hamlet's revenge. It's worth noting, by the way, that this reformulation has also been proposed in English. Um, in his short book, focusing just on this soliloquy, appropriately titled To Be or Not To Be, Douglas Bruster proposes turning the soliloquy into a question of to do or not to do as one means of making sense of it. So he says, to be could mean something like to act and not to be not to act. Now to replace parts of the line in translation, at least in Japanese translation, is unavoidable. But I think there is something problematic in narrowing the meaning in English by replacing Shakespeare's choice of verb with another. Nevertheless, Bruster's substitution shows that the sense of action or lack of action is a reasonable interpretation of the phrase even without the problems of translation. In fact, as Colin again points out, the sense of action versus inaction is one of the ways Hamlet himself construes his meaning. He, he quickly interprets his own opening question as the choice between stoicism and activism, not an obvious interpretation of it by any means. Should he accept his troubles and serenity or sh should he act so as to overcome them? In this case, if, he, if the translator chooses to do or not to do, they make what is implicit in the text explicit, perhaps at the expense of other possible meanings. Nevertheless, as different as to do or not to do is from to be or not to be, the choice is evidently based on a translator's deep critical understanding of the text. One of the biggest exceptions to those three common translations of the line is Bunji Raguchi's rather amusing 1934 translation, which is it? That's the question. <laughs> 
This might reasonably call dynamic equivalence in translation studies terms. That is to say, it's more a translation of the feeling of the phrase rather than a direct translation. But I'm personally quite fond of it because it's evocative in a peculiarly Japanese kind of way that consists of understatement and a preference for pointing towards something literally inexpressible in the language by literally not expressing it. The other exception is the most recent translation by Kenji Oba in 2004, which focuses on the philosophical dimension by choosing to translate the phrase into the wordy, though understandable form, the right and wrong of existence is the problem that faces me. Not snappy like to be or not to be. But even as it tries to do justice to the broader philosophical questions involved in Hamlet's musings, Orwell's translation has the effect of limiting the wider ontological issue into a question of just the good and evil of existence. Now, this very quick overview gives a sense, I think, of the way each translation emphasizes a different aspect of the phrase poetic simplicity, philosophical cogitation, despondency, but none of the translations can contain the multiplicity of meanings evoked by the original to be or not to be. In other words, this speech, or at least this line, pushes up against the limits of the Japanese language, what and how it can signify. So critics of Japanese Shakespeare studies deal with the subject quite often, but they tend to take quite a pragmatic approach. They compare the benefits of each translation and suggest alternatives by pointing out even more interpretations that a translator should consider. But my aim here is to look at early modern English from Latter-day Japan, using translation as a means of thinking about the way that Shakespeare raises issues about human existence in Hamlet's fourth soliloquy. A paper about translation might be expected to focus solely on the question of translation or on the translated work, but my hope is to discuss what one can learn about the original text and what untranslatability can reveal about underlying philosophical foundations of what is probably the most famous speech in the English language. Now, one of the issues that emerges immediately from this look at translation and untranslatability is the idea of content or lack of content. There is a vagueness that stands out because of the awkwardness of the language when the line is translated in particular ways. If the translator has chosen to exist, then it's just not clear what is doing the existing. Is it human? Is it societal or personal? The Japanese to exist as I've said, is rarely used alone without a subject or context to qualify it. In the case of translations that revolve around to become, it's not at all evident who or what is becoming who or what. I pointed out earlier in phrases such as, is it fine to continue as now, or is this fine? The vagueness begs the question as to what is meant by as now or this. Indeed, to focus on Uraguchi's anomalous, which is it, or Workman's satiric and bizarre, it is, it is not, there's just no discernible sense of what it may signify. All these translations are riddled by Hegelian indexicals, I suppose, the it's and this is and that's, that are simultaneously the most particular and universal of words, indicators with no descriptive content. Now, it might be that such radical indeterminateness yeah, such radical indeterminateness is part of the point of literature, where it's at least part of the work of the reader to supply what the text doesn't fix. But a translator faced with uncertainty is called upon to make a decision that often means fixing uncertain meanings. An incomprehensible phrase might otherwise be attributed to a translator's error, to an audience unfamiliar with the original text. And particularly if the translation is for performance, the difficulty lies in finding a phrase that doesn't sound strained or vague or even meaningless. Still, as familiar as this phrase has become to the Anglophone ear, a little awareness reveals that the same vagueness that haunts Japanese translations is also a feature of Shakespeare's words, to be or not to be, that is the question. As most critics of the play are aware, it's only on the surface that this line re appears relatively straightforward. To be what? What is that? And therefore, what exactly is the question? 
Shakespeare is clearly drawing attention to the presence of this verb to be by using it in a way that sounds arrestingly unusual. One doesn't normally say, shall I be? And so by placing it at the end of a sentence or a phrase, and by refusing to follow the verb with an adjective or a noun, it's no different to the Japanese term to exist, which can't be used without pointing to a subject that exists. A bold translator might consider the fact that the English is not natural either, and use Japanese in a similarly unusual matter, manner, but I've never come across a translation that tries to do that. The translation of to be or not to be as to die or not to die, which is the most popular Japanese translation, further emphasizes the fact that there is something deliberate in Shakespeare's unusual use of this verb to be, since the more concrete meaning of to die comes at the expense of something about to be that can't be captured by just to die or any other term. The fact is that Shakespeare could have used a different verb such as to live or not to live or to die or not to die and it's it's not a problem of poetics because it would have fit into the into the meter he's using or he could have introduced a qualifier at the end for instance to be or not to be a revenger and that makes it more comprehensible but aside from the clear poetic superiority of Shakespeare's choice of words in the English being in Hamlet's speech is significant because it draws attention to the use of one of the most structural verbs in the English language, one which is used unthinkingly by most people by the very virtue of its necessity and ubiquity. But why does Shakespeare draw attention to being? The interpretative problem posed by this distressingly hackneyed speech is not really unique to Japanese after all. Now, I don't propose to solve the meaning of being in Hamlet's soliloquy here, but it is evident that this Japanese translational crux draws attention to something fundamental about the original. It forces consideration of the possibilities of the speech, and it re-alienates what ought to be recognized as a syntactically and interpretatively awkward speech. As the translator and scholar Akimasa Minamitani points out of to be or not to be, this is a part where the translator must suffer and use all his wit, but these are also the sorts of places that provide the thrill of translation. For instance, in German, where there is an equivalent verb to be, it is possible to give it a verbatim translation as sein oder nicht sein. But even if that is an easy approach as translation goes, it does not have the challenge that comes from really digging into the original text. It is the very syntactical differences of a language like Japanese that creates peculiarities of translation. And it is in search for the possibilities of creative translated expressions that one can have significant linguistic experiences. The translator who does not have the option to translate verbatim must become a critic of what those untranslatable words mean or don't mean. In the case of to be, something significant emerges, because even though the Shakespearean critic James Calderwood states that it is precisely that most abstract and universal of verbs to be that frets Hamlet in his most famous soliloquy, it turns out that the verb is not universal after all, though existence might be. This has serious implications for the traditional image of Hamlet as the type of modern or post-Renaissance man, which has already been critiqued extensively in the last century from a historical standpoint, but to which a significantly different cultural perspective can provide another point of view. It may also have something to say about how one determines what counts as a philosophical question and the grounds of Western philosophical thinking. Now, before going any further, it's worth considering the hypothesis, hypothesis that the Japanese incapacity to translate the phrase to be or not to be simply shows the poverty of the Japanese language. The missionary and polyglot Reverend Joseph Edkins certainly considered this to be the case in a lecture entitled The Nature of the Japanese Language and Its Possible Improvements, which he gave at the Asiatic Society of Japan in 1872 just around the time that the first translations of Hamlet were appearing in Japanese. So from the ethnocentric premise that the European languages are the most perfect and finished in the world, which was a very popular opinion in the early 20th century, 
and which implies the idea that all languages naturally evolve towards a more perfect form. Edkins took issue with a number of features of the Japanese language, including what has since come to be called its head final structure, where the verb comes at the end of the sentence, as opposed to the head initial syntax of the European languages. His conclusion was that for the human mind to resign itself to the control of so inconvenient a law is a decisive proof of intellectual inferiority. It does not belong to the speech of nations with creative genius. And that the Japanese language and literature are both poor, the literature being a reflection of the language, since greatness in literature is impossible to those who have not been born to the use of an elevated language. Now, Edkins is wrong, of course, but the quality of because the quality of, of Japanese works of literature and its rich culture of poetry and prose stretching back at least as long as English literature, it proves it completely false. But it is true that the Japanese themselves at this time, reacting with confusion at the huge influx of Western culture that followed from the forced opening of the country to trade in 1854, felt that their own language, culture and literature were inferior to the eye-openingly alien works they were suddenly exposed to. The effect was a mass effort at translation of every kind of work, ranging from technical guides to philosophy and literature, with the aim to incorporate, transform, and in some radical cases, to replace Japanese traditions and art forms. So many of the early translators working in the late 19th century attempted what are now referred to as foreignizing translations. That is, they retained foreign words in the hope that such words would be incorporated into the Japanese language, thereby enriching the native tongue. Others, such as Iwano Hōmei, even went as far as to keep the syntax and punctuation of foreign languages, just replacing the words. So he ignored Japanese word order, and he claimed that a change of syntax was essential for grasping new ways of thought. And the very first translations of Shakespeare were part of this move, with famous translators such as Shoyo Tsubochi hoping to introduce the representative works of Western theatre as a playwright himself, in order to transform traditional historical Japanese theatre. Hamlet's soliloquy was itself, independent of the play it appears in, heralded as a vehicle through which new poetic styles could be established in, Jap in Japan, and a, a book called New Poetry Styles appeared in around the same time um, in, the, in the 1880s, which contained three different translations of just to be or not to be. So, in other words, the thinkers of the time were forced to consider the possibility that the Japanese language and their art forms lacked the capacity to express the ideas that were entering the country from the West. Thus, Edkins the missionary, when he advocated for a change in the Japanese language, might not have been speaking too far from some Japanese intellectuals' own sense of the inferiority of their language and traditions. The most crucial difference is his implicit sense that the Japanese might need external help in improving their deficient language. The confidence and vehemence of his well-intentioned but rather misguided idea that foreign educators might be able to help the Japanese improve their own language prompts Roy Andrew Miller to quip that Edkins in his missionary zeal had perhaps mistaken syntax for sin. But putting aside the dated and rather offensive sense of the superiority he exudes, there is still something perceptive about his and others' fixation on language and the kind of expression it allows. For a Shakespearean, one of the more curious statements that Edkin makes in his lecture is the assertion that the, the infusion of French modifying elements beginning from the Norman conquest and of Hebrew, originated by the intense study of our sacred records, modified and mo molded our own language to form to a form which might suit the genius of Shakespeare. The choice of Shakespeare is, no doubt, in, dictated by the opinion of the time, and the qualitative judgments about genius are of no great consequence to the more important idea that Shakespeare, in spite of all the words he may have invented, was subject to the language available to him. What matters is not whether the inability to express a certain idea makes one language inferior to another, but the fact that any language shapes what can be said by speakers of that language. Now, 
in case you've been wondering when I'm actually going to talk about proper philosophy, this brings us straight to the so-called linguistic turn and early Wittgenstein and his claim that the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. That is, language dictates the limits of the sayable, so that a structure of a language has a lot to do with what, can, what one can express, discuss, and even think. Far from proving the inferiority of the Japanese language for not being able to express the same thing one can in a European language, however, Wittgenstein's critique can show how languages allow one to say too much, or rather that they have the capacity to allow meaningless sentences to appear as though they have meaning. And this is a point that Wittgenstein maintains in his later work as well. In the big typescript, he comments that, that our language keeps seducing us into asking the same questions. So long as there is a verb be that seems to function like eat and drink, humans will continue to bump up against the same mysterious difficulties and stare at something that no explanation seems able to remove. It's important not to forget that Hamlet is a work of dramatic fiction rather than philosophy, but insofar as to be or not to be contains philosophical sentiments and an unusual syntax, it is worth discussing from this perspective. The problem with a phrase like to be or not to be for Wittgenstein is that it uses the verb be like eat or drink. It attempts to use language for something that is inexpressible. It phrases things in a way that goes against the logical structure of language. Diagnosing metaphysical questions in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein says, the reason why these problems of philosophy are posed is that the logic of our language is misunderstood. So it may not be that Japanese can't express enough. It's that English or many other European languages appear as if they're saying something when they're not. Now, according to the branch of epistemology inspired by the limitations Wittgenstein placed on philosophical thinking in the Tractatus, metaphysical uses of terms such as existence or being are nonsense or meaningless because they don't have any provable empirical significance or they attempt to use language for something that is inexpressible, or they phrase things in a way that goes against the logical structure of language. Thus, as Wittgenstein puts it, what can be said at all can be said clearly, and what we cannot talk about, we must pass over in silence, the famous final words of the Tractatus. It's important to add, though, that Wittgenstein's idea of nonsense doesn't have any pejorative connotations. It's not gibberish, but anything that lacks context, sense, and reference. This implies a narrowed sense of what constitutes as meaningful, where meaning refers to anything that has an empirically or con concretely explicable sense. Anything beyond that, including art and religion, can't meaningfully be put into words, even if it isn't meaningless as such. Now, from the perspective of this kind of logical positivism, to be or not to be is meaningless. It's a pseudo statement, since like the phrase Caesar is and, it's countersyntactical. As I've already indicated, syntax requires to be to be followed by a noun, verb, or an adjective in most cases. And the beginning of Hamlet's soliloquy breaks this logical rule. And there's a great quotation from Rudolf Carnap, who notes that perhaps the majority of the logical mistakes that are committed when pseudo statements are made are based on the logical faults infecting the use of the word to be in our language and of the corresponding words in other language, at least in most European languages. The first fault is the ambiguity of the word to be. It is sometimes used as copula pre prefix to a predicate, I am hungry, sometimes to designate existence, I am. This mistake is aggravated by the fact that metaphysicians often are not clear about this ambiguity. The second fault lies in the form of the verb in its second meaning, the meaning of existence. The verbal form feigns a predicate where there is none. The sign for existence is such that it cannot, like a predicate, be applied to signs for objects, but only to predicates. Most metaphysicians since antiquity have allowed themselves to be seduced into pseudo statements by the verbal and therewith the predicative form of the word to be, e.g. I am, God is. Thus, because to be or not to be is logically and syntactically, syntactically incomplete, it's a philosophically meaningless sentence, an att attempt to say the unsayable. Now, according to this school of thought, it's not so much that Hamlet is posing a deep existential question, but that he's misusing language and creating problems that aren't really there. 
Even in his later writing, Wittgenstein is consistent on this one point, for as he says in his philosophical investigations, philosophical problems arise when language goes on holiday, which is to say that issues in philosophy happen when language is taken out of context, and words that are designed to be used in one way are made to stop obeying rules. So Hamlet is misusing to be. If we take Wittgenstein's critique seriously, then the effect is much like Kuniyoshi Munakata's Buddhist version of this fourth soliloquy. To be or not to be is no longer the question. This rephrasing of Hamlet's famous words is just as applicable to the way that ordinary language philosophy dissolves metaphysical questions as it is to Buddhist detachment and enlightenment. Of course, Wittgenstein's project was mainly to draw a limit to thought, or rather not to thought, but to the expression of thoughts and thus to set out the boundaries of philosophical thinking. So for him, as for Carnap, art is of a different category, since it's not philosophy, and its purpose is not to make truth claims about the world. Nevertheless, the ideas they present about the use of metaphysical language sheds light on translation. For contrary to Edkin's sense of the superiority of the English language in its capacity to express complex ideas, it turns out that the grammatical structure of English and other European languages might actually allow for a grave misuse of language to masquerade as profound questions about human existence. As I've been suggesting, it's possible that to be or not to be is not untranslatable because of a deficiency in the Japanese language, but because it is grammatically nonsensical. But the point is not to disparage the significance of Hamlet's soliloquy. On the contrary, I've written extensively on the ontological meanings or, or lack thereof of to be or not to be and other such nonsensical lines in Shakespeare because I do believe that these moments of impenetrability are part of what makes Shakespeare's writing important. And logical positive ideas about meaningfulness, meaningfulness are thankfully not the only way of theorizing metaphysical ideas of, or meaning. But such discussions are meaningful in combination with questions about translatability because they can expose the cultural conditions required even to express questions about existence in a certain way. Cultural conditions are significant from a Japanese perspective as well. Because there's a lot to be said about a language and culture that can't express existential questions in this grammatically incorrect manner. If the limits of my language mean the limits of my world, then to be is not simply untranslatable, but also unthinkable in some ways, at least in Japanese. Is it that Shakespeare can't be translated adequately into Japanese, not just linguistically, but conceptually? Soseki Natsume, one of the great novelists of the Japanese fin de siècle, spent two years studying in London as, as Japan's first English literary scholar, under the sponsorship of the Japanese government at the time. And that's around 1902. But his great immersion in English literature didn't make him think Shakespeare translation possible. Even as he expressed respect for Tsubo Tishoyo's effect, efforts at the first performance of a full translation of Hamlet in Japan in 1911, he reviews the performance quite negatively. He expresses the view that since Hamlet was written in England 300, 300 years earlier in blank verse, it's unwise to approach the text with the belief that it's going to fit Japanese ideas perfectly. For Natsume, there's a unbridgeable gap between the play and the audience, and Tsubouchi's faithfulness to Shakespeare constitutes a kind of unfaithfulness to the Japanese audience because it doesn't use any of the words that Japanese people require psychologically and out of custom so that it becomes forced Japanese to fit Shakespeare's wording. In fact, Natsume categorically asserts that the fundamental nature of Shakespeare's plays does not allow a Japanese translation, and to do so means to abandon the Japanese people. Such criticism voices a deep concern about identity in a rapidly changing country with and expresses a kind of nationalistic sentiment which is simultaneously a clear-eyed concern about westernization. Despite being a lover of Shakespeare's works himself, Natsume warns against thinking one's own tastes, that is one's Japanese tastes, inferior by taking the Western view that Shakespeare's works are clear shadows of the mirror of nature, as critics of the time like to say. 
He points out that while it's not entirely wrong that he, he has a way of commenting on the world, there are extremely unnatural phrases present in Shakespeare's works, which he finds hard to believe would have been colloquial for any person of any age, because the poetry goes beyond ordinary language. No doubt, to be or not to be is just one of these phrases. Now, I've paraphrased Natsume extensively here because he touches on something at the heart of the problem of translation. And that is not just the difficulty or impossibility of him, for him, of translating Shakespeare, but the fact that untranslatability is a symptom of an immense cultural gap. He captures this sense concisely in his novel Sanshiro, where the hero sees a production of Hamlet in Japanese, and this is probably a, a parody of Tsubochi's production of Hamlet. And this hero feels that while it is good Japanese with rhythm, fluency, and dignity, Hamlet does not seem to be speaking like an ordinary Japanese man. Hamlet is expressing thoughts that don't belong to the Japanese person in words that don't exist in Japanese. In other words, beyond the immediate socio-historical circumstances of Natsume's critique of Shakespearean translation lies a concern with what is expressible in a particular language and the historical nature of what may appear to be universal. As he says in his A Theory of Literature, when I appeal to my own experience, I learn that the realm of poetry created by Shakespeare does not possess that universality which re European critics ascribe to it. For us as Japanese, it requires years of training to develop a proper appreciation of Shakespeare. And even then, this is only a dim appreciation based on a deliberate adaptation of our sensibilities. Evidently, understanding is not just a case of translation, but of a learning of a different way of thinking, of adapting one's sensibilities. Hamlet is a case in point of Wittgenstein's suggestion that what can be said depends on one's language, because it shows that the limits of what can be said are also the limits of how one thinks and acts in any given culture. There is some historical evidence to suggest that while Hamlet was one of the more popular English works to be translated into Japanese in the in the early in the late 19th century, what the readers really appreciated about the play was not what most Western viewers would consider to be the key features of the play. The play didn't appeal because of the, the philosophical questions that have made it one of the key pieces of tragic literature in the Western canon, but because the revenge plot resembled many popular Japanese stories of honor and revenge. It's some indication of the difference in focus that none of the early versions, and that's about five different translations, and most of them are more like adaptations rather than verbatim translations. None of these early versions contained any of the soliloquies that so characterize the pensive prince of Denmark. Even though the to be or not to be soliloquy was first translated independently of the play in 1882, as I mentioned earlier, most early translations stayed at plot level or excised the soliloquies entirely, so that the first full appearance of To Be or Not To Be was not until 1911 at that first performance of the first translation. As Hisaya Niki notes, the essential dramatic situation of the original could be transplanted in a cruder form, but in the course of translation, the prince lost most of his introspective qualities. Evidently, there was something about Hamlet as presented in the English text, which wasn't easy for the Japanese imagination to accept or understand. Now, if one accepts that language is the basis of metaphysical speculation, the fact that there is no word to express what the word being means in English and most European languages suggests that there's no way of thinking of this concept in quite the same way in Japanese. Japanese critics regularly claimed that when Hamlet was first being translated, Japan didn't yet have the depth of understanding required for a complex piece of literature like the play it was. Now, that theory is problematic on a, on a number of levels, one in its acceptance of a model of progression that posits the West as a kind of epitome of complexity and depth, with Japanese literature unable to imitate, express or understand its complexities. But secondly, and more importantly for the argument I'm making here, it implies that early Japanese adapters and audiences of Hamlet had the possibility of understanding, but were simply undereducated or underdeveloped. <laughs> 
I'd like to suggest in contrast that if language is what delimits the, word, the world of the speakers of that language, it wasn't so much that they lacked the capacity or the education as the means of understanding or engaging with Western philosophical notions. It's not too radical to suggest that the influx of foreign language was also the introduction of a new way of thinking. Even if Japanese as a language couldn't change to that level, those who studied another language gained access to a means of thinking in these different ways that were coming into Japan. And this isn't entirely based on speculation. As Takahashi has argued, Western literature, and particularly Shakespeare, had a profound effect on young minds at the turn of the 19th century. He says, without the plays having been actually performed yet, Prince Hamlet became for the young literati what he had become for the European romantics a century before, a modern self, doubting everything, but true to his own doubting conscience, fiercely critical of the established order, lonely and vulnerable. I think it's true that the Japanese were always introspective in their own way prior to Western influences. But the kind of modern self represented by Hamlet was, as many in the time, at the time recognized, it was something new. It was the birth or awakening of a new kind of self-awareness for Japanese youths. Now, this might be illustrated best by a famous suicide case of a 17-year-old student of English literature named Misao Fujimura. Fujimura, who was one of Natsume's pupils, threw himself into the Kegon Falls north of Tokyo, leaving a suicide poem carved into a tree trunk nearby. And it's worth some consideration. And you can see there's, that's a photograph of the suicide note, which is, um, which is strangely still available as a, as a souvenir if you go to the Kegon Falls. Now, so, so this is the poem that he left behind, a suicide note. Thoughts on the precipice. How immense the universe, how eternal history. I wanted to measure immensity with this small five foot body. What authority has Horatio's philosophy? The truth of all crea creation is captured in a word that is unfathomable. Troubled with this regret, I finally determined to die. As I stand atop the precipice, I have no anxiety in my heart. I understand for the first time, great pessimism is equivalent to great optimism. This poem, or suicide note is both extremely precocious and very thought provoking. And the things that strike me in relation to my talk today are the metaphysical nature of Fujimura's desire to understand the entire universe, the separation of his consciousness from the universe he wishes to measure himself against, and his mention of Horatio's philosophy. This kind of thinking, this idea that, that you and the universe are separate doesn't have much place in traditional Japanese ideas, which are determined largely by a set of complicated traditions that I can't really do justice to here. But it includes Confucianism, which construes self in relation to other social relations, Shinto belief, which is about the self in relation to nature and country, and Buddhism, which by and large considers the self and the ego as an inhibition to enlightenment. Even a cursory glance at these three main schools of thought, though, reveals that there is traditionally no subject-object split in the understanding of self and world in Japanese thought. As Takahashi argues, Fujimura's suicide was construed at that time as symptomatic of the anxiety over the problem of self, which had been occurring in the Japanese psyche under the rage for material prosperity ever since the Meiji Restoration. This is no doubt true. But I propose the possibility that the crisis of individualism, the psychological disjointedness of a young generation caught between different cultural identities has a specifically linguistic aspect to it. And it's a linguistic aspect that's expressed here by Fujimura in his suicide note by his mention of Horatio's philosophy. The philosophy of Horatio that Fujimura writes of here is a reference to the moment in Hamlet when Hamlet tells his friend, there are more things in heaven and Horatio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. It's a widely accepted fact that Hamlet means natural philosophy or rather what we would call science today. So he's talking about the fact that the ghost has appeared and it's not scientifically explicable and that the your of your philosophy is actually a general term, meaning that he's not discussing Horatio's personal philosophy, but the field of, of the study of natural philosophy. 
So there can be no doubt that Fujimura misunderstood the specific construction and meaning of this phrase. And yet something evidently appealed to him about the inexpressible. And something about Hamlet touched this young and troubled imagination, which wanted to find an answer to the meaning of existence. So despite the untranslatability of to be or not to be, it's apparent that Fujimura had grasped the metaphysical implications of the question of being, and it would seem Hamlet, which he was studying in English at the time, was a point of reference. English literature in English appears to have made, made something thinkable for Fujimura, and if we are to take him at his word, that something was quite overwhelming. The conclusion to this paper can't just to be, can't just be, be to say that different languages are able to say different things, or to claim that Western languages have corrupted Japanese. There can be no doubt that different possibilities were opened up to Japanese people through the influence of foreign languages and the thinking made possible by those languages, to the extent that modern Japan has created ways of thinking, of talking about concepts that previously didn't exist in their language. But there are some parts of a linguistic system that are simply not a question that are not simply a question of importing or inventing new words and to be continues to remain a peripheral rather than a fundamental part of the Japanese language. So what might this crucial grammatic difference say about our fundamental assumptions about what counts as a questioning of the world? Arguably, the entire premise of Western philosophy is the search for truth of what things are, their being, and a question about how beings act or ought to act. In metaphysics, the case is obvious. It's a branch that examines the nature of existence. Epistemology is about how one, presumably an existence, can know about things, that is, the existence of the world, and what that says about the kinds of beings we are. Ethics is about how we navigate the relationship between beings, how to treat other beings. Logic is just a means of questioning the methods by which we establish philosophical claims across the field, so I suppose it's a kind of metaphilosophy. It would appear that for most of Western philosophy, as it is for Hamlet, the focus is on the nature of being. Indeed, perhaps the reason Hamlet and his soliloquy are so often considered an expression of philosophical deliberation rather than just a question of suicide is that it touches at the core of philosophical thinking. And yet, it would seem that such a focus is historically and culturally contingent, partly a question of language and grammar rather than truth as such. As Kitaro Nishida, the founder of the so-called Kyoto School, asks, must we assume Occidental logic to be the only logic, and must the Oriental way of thinking be considered simply as a less developed form of it? Willing as I am to recognize Occidental lo logic as a magnificent systematic development, and intent as I am on studying it first as one type of world logic, I wonder if even Western logic is anything more than a special feature of the historical life, an aspect of the self-formation of the historical life. Such a thing as formal abstract logic will remain the same anywhere, but concrete logic as the form of concrete knowledge cannot be independent of the specific features of historical life. In other words, Nishida feels that aside from formal abstract logic, which like mathematics doesn't rely on historical circumstance, the idea that logic should form the foundation of knowledge is itself contingent. In other parts of his writing, he would expand this to say that an understanding of being is not the only or necessary object of metaphysics. It may be that untranslatability and the untranslatability of Hamlet's to be or not to be particularly points to such a contingency. The fact that being as the central object of philosophical consideration is contingent. It highlights the assumptions that a given culture considers fundamental, perhaps without necessarily being aware of it. This is a point famously made by Nishida, who thought that one way to distinguish between the types of culture of the West and East from a metaphysical point of view was to divide them into that which considers the ground of reality to be being and that which considers this ground to be nothingness. With, of course, being being the West and nothingness being the East. <clears throat> 
Of course, Nishida's thought is a little bit more complicated than the rather general and simplistic way he puts it here, but it certainly seems telling that the East, or at the very least Japan, did not develop a language based on being, as most Western languages did. Now, while it may seem obvious on some level, Shakespeare was dependent on the ways of expression and thinking available to him in his language to have written this speech at all. And he was thus reliant on the many possibilities of this verb to be, so central to English. It may be that Shakespeare simply stays within this assumption or that he draws attention to our reliance on being centered forms of thinking in writing such a speech. But in either case, it seems no accident that the soliloquy has transcended the boundaries of the play to become an expression that captures something fundamental about thinking, at least in the Western tradition. Thank you.